name is Don Murray, and I'm the chair of the Managed Council of Washington, D.C. I want to welcome you here for the conversations with Don on you. Our guest today is Vincent Gray, the chairman of the city council. I'm a part of Vince's family. Um, uh, I, I've come to know different people at different times. Uh, I actually knew Vince, uh, first met Vince when I was the director of the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs, and I think at the time he was running the D.C. Mental Health Association and also met him again when he became the Director of Human Services and we sort of reversed roles. He was in the government, I was out. Uh, I then got to know Vince really through his daughter, uh, John East. Uh, his daughter is a lawyer, my daughter is a lawyer. They both did clerkships in Baltimore and so I became part of the family through that process. Uh, I then got to know his son when Vince asked me to chair his first campaign and Carlos Gray was actually the person who did a wonderful job working with the public housing residents in the city. And so Vince and I have now been linked for probably about 20 years, uh, more intently the last, I would say the last six or seven. So it's a real pleasure um, for me to, to start this conversation off. And what I thought I would do is, uh, I saw it in my mind, I said, what kind of theme uh, do I want, how do I want to do this? And what I decided on was the theme, Pathway to Politics, because Vince didn't really start out as a politician. Many of the people we find now, they go into politics, they start out at politics. Uh, Vince has always been a politician in the jobs he's done, but in terms of now he's actually an elected politician that has the consistency that he has to relate to. So what I want to do is just start off, because I think you have to build up to, to the president. Um, I want you to, Vince, to just talk about the values uh, your mother and father um, brought to the table that in many ways uh, shaped not just you as a politician, but begin to influence you as a person? That's a great question, Don. First of all, I want to thank uh, everyone for inviting me, and I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity, Joy, to be up here with Don. Uh, Don is a great person, Don and Lucy. I, I rarely talk about <laughs> Don, and if I don't talk about Lucy as well. And in addition to all the things he said, we not only live in Ward 7 together, but we are neighbors. We live right around the corner from one another and, of course, are both very active in the Hillcrest Civic Association as well as, for me in particular, other parts of the ward. Um, I heard several people introduce themselves as native Washingtonians, and I am a proud native Washingtonian uh, also. And I am a proud graduate of the D.C. public schools, uh, K through 12. I went to Logan Elementary School, I went to Langley Junior High School, and then I went on to Dunbar High School after that, and then went on to undergraduate and graduate school at George Washington University. Um, interestingly enough, neither one of my parents ever went to high school, um, and it wasn't because they weren't, you know, they were very intellectually capable people, but my mother came out of a rural area of North Carolina, and my father came out of Southern Maryland, and they really didn't have the opportunities that were available to people um, today. But what the, they, they truly understood what was important in life, and they instilled in me and my brother a set of values that we both lived with um, all of these years. Uh, one of them is integrity, and that is, you know, when you, when you tell somebody something, your word is your word is you. And the moment you tell somebody something and you don't live up to that word and don't have a good reason for why it didn't happen, then people won't trust you anymore. And I've tried to always be, as a result of that, a person of integrity. So that even if it isn't good news, at least it is truthful news. And that people will walk away from the conversation in those instances, perhaps disappointed, but they won't walk away saying that this is a sleazy, underhanded, double speaking, you know, individual who can't be trusted. The second thing is a work ethic. Um, I, my, my father um, worked two jobs his whole, his whole life. He worked at Freedman's Hospital. Anybody remember Freedman's Hospital? Um, he worked his way up as about, about as far as he could go. He was in charge of the entire um, supplies, I guess is the best way to put it. Everything that came into the hospital ultimately came into his um, area. And he never let education stand in the way of am his ambition and his ideas. As a matter of fact, during the time that he was there, um, Freedman's was kind of a quasi-governmental. I never quite understood this, but it was connected to the government. And my father actually invented something. Anybody, anybody know what a sphygmomanometer is? 
It's a fancy term for a blood pressure machine. Oh, okay. And, you know, back in the day, they used to be really bulky. And physicians and nurses used to have to carry these things from one room to another, Don. And my father invented this mounting instrument that, you know, they put these things on, and they then were much more mobile than they otherwise had been before. And because he was connected to the government, what he got was a $200 check and a, and a certificate for all of his effort. If he had been in the private sector, undoubtedly he would have been a rich man because those things then became used in every hospital across the country. And when they did his obituary um, in the paper when he passed away, that was the first thing that they talked about, and that was this invention. He drove a cab at night, um, you know, to help make ends meet. We lived in a I never even slept in a bedroom until I was 23 years old. Um, I slept on a rollaway bed in the living room. But all along the way, what my parents taught me was a good work ethic. And I've always tried to live by that. And that is, if you commit yourself to doing something, then get it done however long it takes. Um, we were talking about the mental health department early, and I think there are times when people think I should be committed to the mental health department. Um, because I will, work, I will work 14, 16, 18 hours a day because I honestly believe that if it is worth doing, it is worth doing the right way. I've tried to instill that in my children because it was instilled in me and those who work with me, and that is if you come to a task, do it and do it right however long it takes. So I guess among the many things that I could say, Don, the, the issue of integrity and the is, issue of work ethic are the two values that are most important to me. And I've seen, let me just say this, in, in my dealings with Vince, both of those come uh, across uh, very clearly. The other thing that he didn't say that it was happened to be a motto when I was working the government is excellence. The idea that I think Vince has a high standard and expects the people that work with him to actually bring that standard to it. Uh, to follow up on that, one of the things that, uh, in Washington that you see now is that in terms of communities, the idea that communities are always changing. And you grew up pretty much in a segregated Trinidad community. And I'm just sort of curious about when you look back on that community experience, uh, how did it affect like, life choices? What were the institutions you remember from that community? Uh, mm -hmm. And I guess in, in, in some ways I'm sort of asking the same question about what did you take away from the community that you think when you grew up that is different for a lot of people now growing up in communities in Washington? Well, there was a sense of community in a way that we don't have a sense of community now. Um, there, were, there were structures, formal and informal, that worked effectively for children. I, I grew up in a pretty rough neighborhood. I grew up in 6th and L, uh, Northeast. Um, and D.C. Is, is famous for its one block streets. Um, we had one called Callan Street that the only, you better have a passport if you went through Callan Street, if you, if you weren't known. Uh, there was Morton Street, Orleans Place, which was notorious for drug activity for many, many years, all of which were right across the street uh, from where I grew up. But all of that notwithstanding, there was a tremendous sense of community, a tremendous sense of extended family. And that is, your mother and your father, you know, obviously disciplined their kids and they were in charge. But there were people who were just as empowered in the community. You go out and do something and they felt empowered to be able to discipline you. And many times the news of what you did got home before you did. Um, and I, I know me and a lot of my friends were in situations like that where you know, there were neighbors or people around the corner who knew you, who were appalled at something you may have been doing, and they felt no compunction about letting your parents know and about disciplining you themselves. That is a changed dynamic. You know, there was a time when parents, principals, and teachers worked effectively together, and they could box in kids. You know, when kids wanted to, you know, kind of wiggle out of a situation, not maybe tell the truth on what happened, they always were boxed in by that, that important relationship. Today, what we have now is seemingly contempt, mutual contempt between parents and those who work in our schools. Look at this, this ridiculous situation that happened at Coolidge High School, where parents went up there and wound up getting in a fight, you know, in front of children and into a, a big argument and a fight um, with the teachers. So I think there was a real sense of community. There's this adage that we hear over and over and over and over again about it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it was true. The village was raising children, and we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of opportunity. There were gangs. In fact, th to be honest with you, some of the things that existed in those days were more organized than they are now. <laughs> we talk about the gangs were better organized in my day. 
There were two and three hundred people in gangs. How many of y'all been around D.C. all your life? Remember the, there was a group called the Leijord, Leijord Park? Oh, the Roman Nuggets, there were all kinds of, you know, Junior Tag, it was all kinds of gangs. Now, you know, some of y'all, come on, some of y'all remember all this stuff, right? So, you know, don't, don't be trying to pretend out there. And the recreation, the recreation centers were a lot more. Every, I, I was a baseball player, and I actually got a chance to get to some pretty high levels of baseball. But my first experience of playing organized baseball, I played on the 12 and under team when I was eight years old. In fact, the first game I ever played, Connie, was at Kelly Miller. Really? Kelly Miller, that's right, I'll never forget it. But every recreation center had organized programs, and we don't have that anymore today. So it's almost as if we've gone backwards in terms of what our communities provided to our children growing up. My community, again, had a lot of challenges, but it provided adults who were mature, who understood how to raise kids, who had good values, and neighbors who understood their important role in raising children also and worked in concert with others, despite all the little, <clears throat> little challenges that we may have had in the neighborhood. One of the things, and you sort of, you sort of alluded to it, is this whole idea of what role, and, you, and it's interesting that you continue to do it, did competitive sports play in your life? The mm -hmm. idea that you, I know you still play baseball. I do. And mm -hmm. uh, baseball in many ways is a disappearing game in, in the cities. And I'm just sort of curious as somebody who uh, played baseball throughout your life and obviously still enjoy it, what role did one baseball play in, in your growth, but, but competitive sports in general? Well, I think, I think for, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're taught right, you know, if you're coached right, you know, the coaches are like extended family. They're people who are raising you along with um, your family. And frankly, sports can really instill a strong sense of self-confidence um, in children. Um, and that's why coaches are so important, to help kids, first of all, enjoy what they're doing. And second of all, if they're good at it, to try to teach them the fundamentals and bring them along. It really gave me a sense of self-confidence. It gave me an opportunity to be involved in competition because whether we like it or not, life is competitive. And you know, I don't know how, I don't know what endeavor you go into where it isn't competitive. I mean, you, if, if, if there are two or more people involved in it and, it, and there's you know, one fewer position than there are people, you can be sure that there will be some competition for whatever that, those positions are because that's just the nature of life. Um, I had a chance to play, I had a chance to play baseball, basketball, and football growing up. And the other thing is, you make friends. The, the, I have lifelong relationships. I, I saw the other day at the, at the march a guy who was, there, who was a photographer all of his career with Metro, most of his career with Metro. Well, he and I played on that same 12 and under baseball okay. team uh, for Logan, for Logan uh, Recreation Center. We then went on to high school together, played the, on the same high school team, and we never lost contact. We never lost that relationship that really evolved initially out of a relationship on an athletic field. Right. Let, me, uh, let me follow up. What has kept you playing? What has kept me playing is, is I love it, first of all. Okay. Um, the, the steadfast desire to be in complete denial about getting old. <laughs> 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 you know, I believe in the adage that um, you, don't, you don't stop doing because you get old. You get old because you stop doing. Yeah. And, and so many people just, you know, assume when they reach a particular number that they should stop doing certain things. Well, I refuse to give in to that. Um, and I don't think there's any particular reason to. You know, and what's happening, even as sports at the highest levels now, baseball, you see more and more players playing in, well into their 40s. And we even have football players now who are playing into their late 30s and, and 40s. We've got basketball players who are playing into their 40s. It also gives you a motivation to keep yourself fit. Because you're not going to be able, as you get older, you do lose, you know, some speed. You lose, you know, some eye-hand coordination. Your reflexes get a little bit slower. So you've got to be able to do things to compensate for it. And that gives you the motivation to stay fit. So it's those things that kept me playing. And to tell you the truth, given what I do, I play on, one, on a team where the guys who just come out there to play baseball, they don't want to talk about anything else. And it is wonderful to go out there for a couple of hours and not have to listen to somebody lobbing me about some contract, about some grant, or about some issue. All they want to talk about is baseball. And they talk, some of it's even frivolous. And you know what? It is wonderful to be able to just <laughs> engage in a conversation like that. Uh, let me get a little bit more serious again. Uh, and looking at, uh, you know, both your family, community, and, and even sports to a start, 
What role did uh, the experience at Dunbar High School? I mean, because uh, uh, one of the things uh, I'm from Baltimore, and one of the things I noticed is that people in Washington uh, are so, and it goes both ways, but have a lot of uh, pride and feeling for Dunbar. And I'm just curious when you think, when you look back on it, what was it about that experience that not only helped you? In the while you were going through the experience, but when you moved to George Washington, mm -hmm. because you went probably much, pretty much a segregated environment to a to I guess uh, a, a integrated environment in a, in a certain sense. And I'm just curious, what what did you take away from that? What do you think you got at the Dunbar experience that enabled you to be successful when you went to George Washington? Well, first and foremost, I got a tremendous education. Um, it was a public education as we knew public education back in the day, not some of what we have to contend with uh, today. And frankly, some of our issues are larger than education. There are days when I think education, educational failure is more a symptom than it is the problem. It's more deeply rooted in our society than just education. But I got an incredibly valuable education. I went to a school that had a storied history, um, you know, where there were people who had graduated from Dunbar who were role models. And, and it created a set of expectations. You know, when you went to school, you were expected to perform. We even had, and, and segregation had been over for some no, a number of years, but it still was a segregated school because it drew from the neighborhoods that were around Dunbar, and those were, you know, almost completely African American neighborhoods um, around Dunbar High School, and for the most part, they continued to be. But um, it, th there was a set of expectations when you went there that you would that you would be a, that you would perform that you would get the job done that you would graduate i went back and looked at my yearbook recently and looked at the number of people who graduated with me um, who then went on to college afterwards okay. and it was expected one of two things were expected and that was you either went to college or you went on to work there was not even a question about whether you would graduate or drop out I mean, we weren't talking about dropout rates at that, at that time. We were talking about how you get through. We even had, anybody remember the, the Cadet Corps? Oh, sure. Well, we had a guy named Bill Rumsey who, who ran the military at, at, at Dunbar High School. And everybody was expected to participate. I heard him say one time, because there were people who would come with all kinds of excuses, Don, you know, about why they couldn't do it. And he, he told somebody, he said, you know what, if you can't walk for these, these, this hour or two hours that we have to do it, then you're too sick to be able to come to school. <laughs> so you just need to leave school. And at the same time that he created that kind of rigorous role model relationship in the lives of young people, he also had a level of sensitivity where he reached out and he understood. There were kids who didn't have a lot of money who went to Dunbar High School. You know, the perception of Dunbar being the high school of the elite is really a misnomer. Um, most of us who went there, you know, we came from working families. You know, there, there was no whole lot of money in, on the part of people who went there. I've seen him bring shirts and ties and whatnot for young people who were really trying to make it, to be able to have what they needed, to have the dignity of participating so they didn't have to feel different. If we were willing to make the effort, he would reach out to us similarly and make sure we had the basic tools that were necessary in order to participate effectively. And when I look back, I look back on Bill Rumsey, I look back on Jesse Chase, you know, who was J.J. Uh, J. J. Smith. These were coaches that coached me at Dunbar. These were real people. I go back, to, I even go back down to my um, boys club days. And if you ride past number two boys club, where I played as my first organized football, the two, two people's names on that, that building, on M Street and New York Avenue, are two of the coaches that coached me at number two, um, Bill Butler and Julius Wyatt whose names are on the front of that building. And frankly, it equipped me for a very difficult experience going on to George Washington University. That I went from having never in my life gone to school with any, any but my you know, fellow African Americans to a situation in which there were about 15,000 students and 25 African Americans in that school. And let me tell you just flat out, racism was alive and well in that <laughs> university. I, I had one class, I'll never forget, English literature, where act, when I would raise my hand or be called on, the professor actually looked at me differently. Now you can say that's paranoid. Maybe it was, but if you're paranoid, it doesn't mean they're not after you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 
the, the, the fraternal system was segregated on George, everything was segregated at George Washington. In fact, we, we had a basketball team there that actually was better than the varsity. Ask Mark Plotkin. Mark Plotkin went to GW when I went to GW. Ask him sometime about the basketball team that we had that played on that, that campus. I was actually the first African American to be in a fraternity at George Washington University, and it was a civil rights statement. And what was interesting was I still have relationships with a lot of those guys after all of these years, and not only did I wind up going into the fraternity, but even today, I'm, I, I was elected chancellor, which is not the superintendent of the schools, by the way. <laughs> uh, in this instance, it is the president of the fraternity, and I was elected two consecutive years, and I'm the only one to have been a two-term uh, president in that fraternity, which broke up the segregation uh, at George Washington's fraternal system. And let me just say this. I, I happen to know this, and I'm going to do a couple tie-ins. Uh, Bill Rumsey, when he left Dunbar, also became the, one of the first African-American directors of the Recreation Department. Right. Uh, he was one of the mentors when I came into government, and I actually hired his son, Bill Rumsey, Jr., who then went on to become chief of staff for Linda Kropp, who now works, I think, for ARP as a, a legal consultant. And so what you see is that, uh, as Vincent sort of talked about as we've gone through this, the ties that you that develop in all aspects of your lives it really comes back into a full circle, and you begin to see that. I have to ask this question. Um, uh, when you think about Mark Plack, and, uh, has he always been in a pain in the butt, opinionated, <laughs> and unstoppable force for whatever he believes in and champions? Because I think Mark is an interesting guy, and I mean, I just, he, was he like that in college? Well, I'm never going to call Mark Plack in a pain in the butt, <laughs> because the next time I go on his show, I'm sure right. I will pay the price. Mark, Mark is actually a dear friend of mine. And by the way, what that gets you is you get it even worse when you go on the show. <laughs> Mark will call me up and say, hey, can you come on the show Friday? Yeah, and then you go, and about 10 seconds into the show, it's like he's all over you, right? So um, Mark has always been a relentless advocate, and that's how I would describe him. Um, and you see it quite in a very uh, dramatic way in his commitment to voting rights for the District of Columbia. Um, I tell you... Mark is, he's a symbol in a lot of respects, and that is Mark is from Chicago. Yet he has a passion for equality and voting rights in the District of Columbia that far exceeds many of the people who are native Washingtonians. I mean, on this issue, sometimes I wonder why we're so nice about it. Why are we so complacent? Why do we stand around and just, you know, accept any excuse that seems to be, um, you know, provided to us? That march the other day was great. I, I, I think, you know, to see all those people down there, but we've got to sustain that. And it will only be sustained not by organizations like DC Vote. It'll be sustained by citizens who just say, we're not going to take this anymore, and we're going to stay the course until we get what we are, are rightfully due in the District of Columbia. And that's, the, that's what Mark believes. So he is a passionate advocate. And a lot of times, to use your term, Don, passionate advocates are perceived by those who are in the advocacy path as pains in the butt. Right. Because they're relentless. They have, they have, a, they have a, a, a clear mission. They have a vision for where they want to go. They have a mission. They have goals. And they have objectives. And then they invest themselves in making it happen. In essence, they're walking strategic plan. Let me follow up on that. because uh, One of the things that's always fascinated me about you is, the, is your career choices. You were at the DC Mental Health Association. Um, you in uh, human services and to a large extent a covenant house and when I think about all those I think about people who in many ways are invisible they are abused they've been neglected was there uh, was there did you ever think about how you made this career choice in other words how did you end up in many ways uh, working with some of the people in society who are most uh, who are most neglected I, I, um, I knew early on that I really wanted to work with people. And I really, one of the things that gave me the most, most psychic satisfaction was seeing myself be able to reach out in some kind of way and improve somebody's condition in life. Um, I actually, I'm a clinical psychologist by training. And um, um, there was a professor at George Washington University who suggested that I acquaint myself with the Association for Retarded Citizens, which is the organization Don was referring to earlier. I went there for a summer and, um, and then eventually was offered a job there and went to work there. They sent me to a conference, Don, 
at a place called Forest Haven. Oh, yeah. um, and I wasn't, that, up to that point, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. Thought it'd probably be a traditional mental health career. I went to this conference at Forest Haven, and when the conference was over, because I'd never been there before, I decided to give myself a self-guided tour around the grounds. And so I walked around and saw all these buildings, these dormitories, these cottages, and there was a big fence around one of them. And I, I leaned against the fence, and while I was leaning against the fence, the staff person brought out about 20 women, and not one of them had a stitch of clothes on. She took a hose and hosed down every one of them as if they were a herd of animals. Um, and it was just routine. You could see it. It wasn't as she saw any problem with it. It was as, apparently what the routine was day in and day out. And I looked at that situation. I said, you know, there's got to be a better life for people than this. There are very few people who are focusing on this at this stage. And I think I'd like to work with this for a little while and see what we can do to make a difference. Well, we did make a difference, and we were a pain in the butt a lot of times. Um, there were 1,300 people living in this institution 25 miles outside the District of Columbia. We worked with the parents to file suit against the, uh, the institution in the District of Columbia. We developed legislation to create the rights of people with mental retardation. We created prevention legislation, employment legislation, and standards that still exist in the zoning regulations today for how group homes should be developed in the District of Columbia. In fact, you will find that these group homes, even though they have problems too, are far better um, operated than group homes in other areas, uh, other disciplines, if you will, in the District of Columbia. And over time, we were able to move everybody out of Forest Haven. And frankly, we worked with a mayor, Marion Barry, who was very sensitive to this issue, and we were able to move quickly. And people kept saying to me, um, well, there's, there's a certain number of people who have to be there. They have to be there. And I kept saying, well, who, who, who? And the number kept shrinking until eventually we got it down to zero. And the, the District of Columbia was only the second jurisdiction, second state, if you will, in the country that became institution free for its citizens with mental retardation. And I think that shaped, you know, it reinforced my own values. It shaped for me a, a, a life of service. People, I think you even uh, alluded earlier to, how did I get from those jobs to politics? Well, I think they're all, they're all service to people. If, if I, you know, there's an old adage that says, good service is good politics. And that's why I ran for Ward 7. I, it wasn't that I was you know, sitting in the wings waiting for just a door to open to be the next politician. I just, you know, I've been in Ward 7 for a long time, and there were a lot of people who complained about the conditions in Ward 7 and felt we needed a more aggressive approach. And that's why I ran. I ran to be able to serve the people of Ward 7 just as I'd served homeless youth, just as I'd served people at the Department of Human Services, just as I'd served people with mental retardation. And it's one of the reasons why I'm having such a hard time tearing myself away from Ward 7. Um, I don't know how many of you know it, but I, almost, I go to a meeting in Ward 7 almost every night. Um, I was out last night at uh, ANC 7A and the Fairlawn um, Citizens Association. Because I love the people of Ward 7, and I love the fact that we've been able to work together, me being able to provide service to the citizens and see the ward now moving along in a way that really meets the expectations of folks there, gives people something to look forward to, and frankly, to be valued just like other citizens in the District of Columbia. Because a lot of times people say east of the river, and it just conjures up negative notions, unrealistic, un un you know, misunderstanding of who people are and what you know, the experience is east of the river. So I guess I would say, Don, that my whole life experience has been defined by the opportunity to serve people and to feel good about seeing people better off as a result of it. I had to follow this up with when you went from, because both Covenant House and the uh, Retired Association, you were primarily uh, uh, advocates or championing causes. Uh, what was it like, because I know when I went from Friendship House to DCRA, it was a tremendous change going from an advocate to actually running a huge bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And I talk a little bit about that experience. Well, it, it, is, it is an incredible shift. You're absolutely right about that. Um, it, because one of the things you learn very quickly is as much as you would like things move to move quickly, they don't. The one thing that I learned, too, you know, that you can't be this passionate, committed, um, you know, empathetic server of the customers and not recognize that those who work with you deserve the same kind of empathy and understanding. So one of the things that I tried to do at DHS was to try to improve the, the morale of the workforce there by doing things, frankly, 
that led them to feel that they were valued, that they were important. I mean, being a, being a government worker is not the most positive thing. I mean, a lot of times what you get is negative feedback. People will tell you what went wrong. People don't feel that they should tell you what went right because that's what you're supposed to do um, anyway. And people just get beaten down after a point. And I'll tell you, man, and Don knows as well, if you don't work with those grade five, sevens, and nines, you're not going to get anything done. You coming in without being the high and mighty, you're going to be the high and mighty going right out the door. And y'all heard that statement that, you know, we be here when you came and we be here when you gone? The weebies. Um, Don was where he was for a long time. I'm actually the longest tenured director in the, in the history of the Department of Human Services. I was there for the full four years of the administration that I worked for. And a lot of what we did was not only to try to provide services in a very complex and challenging environment where you had all kinds of issues, you know, you were working with, but also to try to work with the workforce. Uh, James Jackson, who's here today, worked with me over at DHS, and he knows, he knows full well. He's been on both sides of this issue, working there and working for the committee, working for the health department, working for mental health, you know, how challenging that environment is. But you've got to be bold enough to not only try to serve those who you're supposed to serve, but also recognize, in my case, those thousands of people, um, you know, who worked at DHS were customers as well. I never forget, Don, we, uh, we decided to have an event for the employees, and somebody said, well, why don't we do it on the weekend? I said, well, you know, I don't think a lot of people are going to come on the weekend. You know, people, when they leave, they, they're not coming back to the workplace for a weekend event. So I said, well, why don't we do it on a, um, why don't we do it on a Friday? Oh, you can't do that. You're going to get in trouble. The media will be here. I said, well, why are we going to get in trouble? Well, you know, people expect folk to be working and whatnot, and you can't do that. I said, you know what? Let's do it and see what happens. Well, you know the media will be coming. They'll be interviewed. You know, Sherwood and all those guys will be out here to, you know, interview you and find out what's going on and blah, blah, blah. So I said, we're going to do it anyway. Well, two things happened. The first thing was a lot of the workforce showed up at like 6 and 7 in the morning to get done whatever they had to get done during the day so that we could, from 12 o'clock until the end of the day, could be out and have this, this picnic in the parking lot. The second thing was there were no media that showed up. And I, there were two reasons why. The first reason was it was a positive thing that was going on. And the second thing is, in no situation like that, 90% of the time it's the employees that call the media anyway. They didn't <laughs> have any reason to call them that day. So um, again, I just simply underscore treating all people with dignity and respect will get you a lot further along than trying to be you know, the monarch um, in jobs like that, because it just doesn't work. It might work in the short run, doesn't work in the long run. When I was in the fourth grade, I read a, uh, a book. I'll never forget. It was a book called More Streets and Roads. Uh, it was the fourth grade book. And there was this very simple story in there that I, I never forgot. There, w there was this man walking down the street. And the wind and the sun were having this conversation, Don. And they said, let's enter into this competition. We're going to see which one can make this man take his coat off. The wind said, I will blow so hard on this man that I will blow his coat right off of him. And the sun said, no, I'm going to take a different approach. I'm going to radiate warmth on him, and he will willingly and voluntarily take his coat off walking down the street. Well, you know what the answer is, and that is a metaphor for life. And that is, you try to blow people over, and all they will do is this. You try to work with them in a warm, nurturing, um, understanding environment, and they will willingly, most of them will willingly take their coat off. I'm going to, let me just say this, I think that uh, the last uh, exchange with Vincent that shared the story with you sort of gives you a sense of him as a person. Uh, I'm going to stop it uh, because I think that you may have some questions you might want to ask and Vince can probably stay here for a few more minutes in terms of what you want to do. Uh, I want to just say publicly that I think that um, I always believe in supporting people that have made a difference not only in uh, the community I live in, but it made a difference in the lives of the citizens. And I think Vince Gray is one of those kind of people.